We're following breaking news out of Georgetown County right now. You do have the right to remain silent. It involves a man named as a person of interest in the Brittany Drexel case. Anything you say can will be used against you in a court of law. Brittany was 17, a junior at Gates Chilai, when she left without her mom's permission for spring break in Myrtle Beach. You know, I woke up in the middle of the night last night thinking about her. Never in my wildest dreams ever thought my child would go missing, but now look where I am. It seemed inconceivable that someone could just virtually vanish walking between two hotels on a very busy strip. We're beside ourselves. It's just, we miss Brittany so, so much. There's so many things that happened before Brittany left. It never made me suspicious one little bit until things came on TV. And then I'm like, okay, what's going on? A man moved into that apartment the day before Drexel disappeared and moved out six months later. They're going to rip the place apart. They're looking for blood evidence, any kind of evidence for Brittany. The people that did this are still in the community. They're bad people. In a race against time to be able to find this body, and confirm what we thought was going on. Nobody should get a second chance to hurt a child. I just started seeing these red flags. He comes back here after he got out of prison. It's starting again. Do you think he could be responsible for Brittany Drexel's disappearance? I think he could be responsible for anybody's disappearance. From the studios of WCIV ABC News 4 in Charleston, South Carolina. I'll give you a story that I don't think has really ever come out. I'm Ann Emerson, and this is Unsolved South Carolina, case file number two. To me, this is a case of that you will remember for the rest of your life, no matter what. Finding Brittany Drexel. Yeah, I'll take you right where the body is, but if I feel like you haven't been there anymore, you will never get that body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a fact. You hear of these things happening, but you're like, never, like that would never happen. From the very start, 13 years ago, there was a terrible fear and confusion when Brittany Drexel went missing. As a parent, uh, that is your worst nightmare. Her parents, Dawn and Chad, newly separated from each other. They had no idea what happened to their teenage daughter or even where she was on that Saturday night, April 25th, 2009. Turns out Brittany had skipped town after her parents told her she absolutely could not go on the trip. Well, the answer is no, Brittany, I'm sorry. I know you're not gonna like it, but I'm sorry. Whatever, and that was the end of that conversation. So then, because I don't live with them, I didn't hear from Dawn until that Saturday. And that was when I got the call. Your daughter's missing. Chad thought Brittany was asleep at her mother's house. Her mother, Dawn, thought Brittany was a few miles down the road at a friend's the teenage switcheroo. Chad remembers that moment when his life changed forever. Uh, the first thing I went to was, wait a minute. What do you mean she's missing from Myrtle Beach? How did she get out of the house? Her house was in Chilai, a suburb of Rochester, New York, 800 miles away from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Here's Chad again. He argues with Brittany in his head as he tells me about their conversation back on Wednesday, April 22nd, 2009. I got a phone call uh, from her mom saying that your daughter wants to go to Myrtle Beach. And I told her no. Well, she says, just call dad, I bet he'll let me. And I actually looked like a jerk because I told her no as well. And here's why. That was a Wednesday. Monday and Tuesday, I had to bring Brittany in late to school again and she's already got D's and F's. Why would I let you go anywhere? on spring break. Well, I need a break from all this. Me and John are arguing this. Oh, so? Go hang with your friends. Here. Well, I don't want to. They want to go down there. That same day, Brittany, well, she drives to Myrtle Beach. A spring break mecca for teenagers. A few days of no curfews, no rules, and most importantly, no parents. But how could a 17-year-old afford such a clandestine trip to Myrtle Beach? Chad said she was just a kid, but a resourceful one. She became her own little entrepreneur as she grew up through the ages. We'll tell you what Chad said was going on with Brittany leading up to the Myrtle Beach trip a little later in this podcast. But first, I want you to meet someone else, one of Brittany's best friends, Jessica Fico. 
She was sassy. She was very strong-willed. I mean, if she wanted something, you knew it, and she was going to get it. So she always found a way. Right. Mm -hmm. And Jessica is a strikingly pretty young woman. Blonde, shoulder-length hair. She's got sparkly eyes when she talks and a strong, friendly smile. You could picture Jessica and Brittany in high school together. Jess, do you like to go by Jess or Jessica? I've already asked you that once. You I don't, don't care. care. No. You answer to everything? Yeah. Mom. <laughs> Mom. Jess. Jessica, um, yeah. Jessica drove to Savannah, Georgia on a warm fall day to meet me. She was accompanied by Brittany's little brother, Camden, who was only five when his sister disappeared. So if you want to get a scad. Mm -hmm. I'd say Savannah's better than Atlanta. He lives in Savannah, Georgia now to attend film school. Brittany is 12 years apart from me, so I was like her, her basically her baby that she had that she wanted, but uh, yeah. A life move that he says was sparked by the endless media controversy surrounding his famous sister, Brittany. We're all hanging out on a park bench under the live oaks. It's a bustling Saturday afternoon in Savannah's Forsyth Park. There's an open air market going on near the large fountain and art and film students strolling by as we talk. They seem to be unfazed by our own camera setup. Unscripted TV, scripted TV, I film, don't, what do you like? I want to go into sports. Oh, you want to do sports? I want to do sports. All right. Yeah. Camden is tall and broad like his father, Chad. He's got a swath of strawberry blonde hair and a cross that hangs from his neck. He wears that cross for Brittany. It holds deep significance. Camden and his sister, Marissa, they're the biological kids of Chad and Dawn Drexel. Brittany, the oldest of the three, was Chad's adopted daughter. She was only three years old when he met Brittany and married her mom, Dawn. So I've known Brittany since she was in elementary school, and um, my God almighty, if I could find those pictures, um, I've done everything to dig them out of photo bucket, and that's just a, a vault. Over the years, Brittany's friend Jessica tells me she stayed incredibly close with the Drexels. Well, I've always been super close with the family. Like, that never wavered um, in Brittany's disappearance, and I actually lived with them for a while after Brittany disappeared, so... Um, you did? I did. Why? Um, it was just, I have, I, I never had like the best family life and Dawn's always been a second mom to me. So, um, me and my daughter moved in there. So I've known Camden since he was, he was a wee baby. So you're like family. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Camden now, I live in Beaufort, which is just about 40 minutes from here. And, um, so we see a bunch of Camden. That's great. You're saying you're going to go get some shoes later. They were headed to buy shoes for Camden. He had a big court hearing in his sister Brittany's case in a few days, and he wanted to look his best. Yeah, we're going to get shoes. <laughs> now Jessica was like a big sister to Camden. She would just live her best life on AOL, like the instant messenger, which poor Camden doesn't even remember those good days. <laughs> but I digress. So what was Brittany like? Jessica says Brittany was popular, she had a ton of friends, a star soccer player. She was beautiful, clever, full of life. She was very bright. She was, she was just, there was, even if she probably wasn't in the best mood, she was always still fine to be around. You know what I mean? Like she still lit up a room. Um, she just had a, a peppy, fun, sassy personality. Jessica says she remembers Brittany was determined to go on spring break to Myrtle Beach, even though her longtime boyfriend, John Greco, stayed behind in Rochester. She, you know, where there was a will, there was a way, and she was strong-willed enough to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And she was going to go to Myrtle. Mm -hmm. What was the draw? I asked former newscaster Ginny Ryan about vacationing in Myrtle. Myrtle Beach is such a popular destination for people in our community. She worked for a station called Wham in Rochester and has been covering the Drexel case since day one. Rochester winters can be very long and very cold. And Myrtle Beach is probably the closest beach you can get to with decent weather in April, which is a popular spring break time, without getting in an airplane. I know a thing or two about Myrtle Beach myself. I was born and raised in the Carolinas. I spent every spring break in high school that I could 
at Myrtle Beach. It was really fun, especially when the southern sun warmed up miles of white sandy beaches and someone, anyone, had a fake ID and the guts to use it. There's always been a time where a kid's not going to listen to the parent. That's Monica Kaysen. Her job? She looks for missing persons full time. You know, no, you're not going to Myrtle Beach because you can, something could happen to you there. There's no adult supervision, and something did happen, and there was no adult supervision. It's why her mom and dad said, no way, and why Brittany just could not resist. There's so many things that happened before Brittany left to go with the acquaintances down her ride to Myrtle Beach, because they weren't friends. They were her ride to get there, just acquaintances she met at parties. And these acquaintances, they're tied to some of the last known moments with Brittany. Let's get back to 2009. It was April 25th, three days after she arrived in Myrtle Beach. Scott Hickson is a state prosecutor who worked on Brittany's case. He recalls that night. 8.15 p.m., you'll see Ms. Drexel actually, she's in the middle of the screen right now walking left to right. She's right above the 04 right there. A surveillance camera on Myrtle Beach's Grand Strand catches Brittany texting and walking from her hotel called the Bar Harbor. It's about a mile and a half up the strip, and it's notorious for cruising up and down, showing off souped up rides, especially during spring break. On the night of April 25th, it's just after sunset and the neon lights of the touristy area flash on. Brittany's headed to another one of her friend's hotels. It's called the Blue Water. We know this also because fortunately, um, like many teenagers in this day and age, uh, she loves to use her cell phone and she loved to text message. And so a lot of the text messages, we were able to determine what was in Ms. Drexel's mind during that period of time. So what did investigators figure out early on? Well, they think Brittany was arguing with her roommates back at her hotel. We also know that there was a little bit of a um, concern over the clothes that she was wearing, um, young teenage girls deciding what they're going to wear that night. There was a discussion about wearing a pair of black shorts that another friend of hers was going to wear that night and that she needed to get back to the Bar Harbor to take those shorts back so her friend could wear them. A little, you know, a little bit of a scuffle between friends and she acknowledges she has to do that. The next time Brittany is caught on camera, she enters a Blue Water Resort. It's a multi-story condo where a friend of hers from Rochester is staying. His name? Peter Brozowitz. He's a self-professed club promoter and DJ. While she's up there uh, returning the, for just less than seven minutes, another text message comes in saying, I want to wear the shirt to come back. So Brittany realizes that she has to walk all the way back from the Blue Water to the Bar Harbor, which is about 23, 25 blocks. We know when she leaves the Blue Water because at 8.48 p.m., we get to see Mr. Exel leave the Blue Water. Um, and we know that she's perfectly fine at that time, and that's the last time that we get to lay eyes on the on Brittany Drexel. But communication is not totally lost yet. And that comes at 8.58 p.m. Her last text message acknowledges that she's on the way back to the hotel and that she's going to stay in for the night because she's going back to Rochester the next day. That's the last electronic communication we know of that Dr Brittany Drexel sent to anybody. So who was Brittany texting with that night? Her boyfriend, John Greco? who stayed back in Rochester. John can't get Brittany on the phone again. He threatens to reach out to her mother, Dawn, and blow her cover, tell her that she's in Myrtle Beach. Brittany never texts back. So, John does it. He calls Dawn. Family and friends, within seven to 15 minutes, right away, realized because she used her phone so much that she, that she wasn't communicating. They immediately became concerned and worried about her. And the text messages continue and continue Brittany, where are you? Are you okay? Are you okay? She never responds. But what really freaks everyone out? Where Brittany's phone pings for the last time. It's an hour south of Myrtle Beach, on the side of a river at a boat landing, in a rural area. The cops know this information very quickly. The final location for that phone, um, where that location dies, is in a, in a electronic arc that puts it in the pole yard location past 11.58 p.m., the time that the signals leave that telephone. She didn't disappear off the face of the earth. Somebody's got to know something. And that's Brittany's mom, Dawn. 
She packs her bags right away and calls Chad to watch Camden and Marissa in Rochester. She heads to Myrtle Beach to find Brittany. Chad recounts the tense conversation. The confusion is building. You need to take the kids and come get them within the next six hours because we're going to Myrtle Beach right now. So I wasn't given the option to even go down and search for my daughter. Come get the kids and you stay with them. Alarm bells sound. With family still hours away, Dawn calls a Drexel family friend stationed at Camp Lejeune. That's two and a half hours away in North Carolina. He starts driving to Myrtle and gets there first. That friend calls law enforcement. Here's Tracy Chinaka with the Myrtle Beach Police. The call came in at, um, like during the early morning hours. And, you know, I was a, a detective, so, you know, I, I didn't come into work till like, you know, 8 o'clock the next morning. Um, but when I got to work, um, I guess it would have been on the 26th um, of April, you know, we were briefed that we had a, a missing 17-year-old um, that was down here for spring break. And um, all of the detective division, all the detectives were tasked with just basically trying to find her. I was called the next day at 11 o'clock. Monica Kaysen runs a Q Center for missing persons. Who called you? Myrtle Beach Police Department and basically put me on standby and said, we've got a missing you know, kid. What were they thinking? That she could be alive, out there hurt. Um, it was an urgency. There was definitely an urgency. It was in the air. Everybody was like, let's go, let's go, let's get out there. You know, it's getting ready to get dark kind of thing. If she is out here, she's already been here one night. Brittany's phone was in dangerous territory, which led investigators to believe so was Brittany. I saw the gator activity, massive gator activity, um, snakes everywhere. It was, uh, you know, wild hogs. I mean, it was, there was like, I always say there was like nine flying objects that would just rip and run. They didn't even stop and bite you. Just like, I mean, the, these scars are all from, they just literally rip your skin off and just take off. And you're always constantly doing this, you know, because they're so, it's, it's really, um, it was really intense. And really vast. Time was not on their side. You could spend years out there searching and still not get it done. I mean, it's just, it's, it's massive. Law enforcement and Monica's organization, the Q Center, brought in an army of people to search for Brittany. Meanwhile, Dawn hit the ground running in Myrtle Beach. Another one of Brittany's high school friends, Tara, came with her. We were searching for her everywhere. We were searching in alleys. We were searching in trailer parks. We were searching in dumpsters, looking for her phone, for her purse, for her. But there's no sign of Brittany. After months of searching, her family is frantic, sick with concern. Here's her mom on August 29th, 2009, just four months after Brittany disappears. It's not knowing where she is, you know. I just want to get her back. I want to hold her and touch her. As the months went by, it became more and more concerning that there were no concrete leads to determine where exactly she went. And that's state prosecutor Scott Hickson again. We knew about the phone, but we really didn't have anything else. And uh, there's, there's an inability to really get movement in the case, a lot of suspicion and a lot of dead ends. It takes two years of searching for Brittany, but then a tip comes in. It's January 2011. The tip holds promise. A convicted sex offender, Raymond Moody, he lives in this area. A family member of Mr. Moody had contacted um, a friend of his and then contacted law enforcement and said, you may want to look at a fellow named Raymond Moody who's living in the area in Georgetown. Um, he had a run, some significant run-ins and spent a significant amount of time in California prior to this, and that may sound like something he might be capable of doing. That's the first time Mr. Moody's name is on the radar for law enforcement. Law enforcement interviews a close associate of Moody. That leads them to the Sunset Lodge in Georgetown, South Carolina. The old lodge sign is weather-beaten, as are the apartments. The Sunset Lodge? It's as infamous as its residents. I'll be sure to share the story of this old boarding house with you, once the best kept secret in Georgetown. Resulted in a search warrant executed in the Sunset Lodge where Mr. Moody lived at that time. I head over there to check out the Sunset Lodge myself. It's about 45 minutes from the station. It's really run down, just cement block apartments. I go up to the room. 22. 
from what I understand from Mike, who, who, who owns this place still and owned it when the police came and searched it back in 2011, they really tore it up. He said they took the wallpaper down. He said that they took the, the mattress uh, and split open the mattress uh, looking for any kind of evidence. We found a story on the raid by WPDE in Myrtle Beach. Police aren't identifying that person of interest, but the motel's owner says a man moved into that apartment the day before Drexel disappeared and moved out six months later. For several hours, slide crime scene technicians with help from Myrtle Beach Police and the Georgetown County Sheriff's Office pulled boxes and bags full of something from the room. At that time, Ms. Voss came forward and expressed significant concerns about the possibility that Mr. Moody could have had something to do with this, um, but was unable to provide any concrete information. The trail runs cold. Moody falls off the radar. Chad says it seemed like a dead end. But you knew who this guy was. You had heard about him back in 2011, right? Yeah, but then that was squashed a month later because they didn't have any hard evidence. Yet Dawn is relentless. She moves to Myrtle Beach to keep searching for her daughter. We're not going to give up. We're not going to stop looking for her. We're here. You're going to see us on the news until Brittany's found. The bad news is there was such media awareness of it that everybody that had a keyboard wanted to claim that they killed Brittany Drexel. It was a challenging time for law enforcement during the period of time. Some are exotically sickening and detailed about what this person claims they did, and law enforcement had to spend a significant amount of time disproving what I would just call these crackpot you know, really breathtaking claims that they had something to do with this. Another lead in the case doesn't come for years. Let's fast forward to June 2016. The FBI enters the picture with a major announcement at a press conference. To some degree, um, this is an expected worst case scenario. Standing in McClellanville, South Carolina, a tiny fishing village that sits off of Highway 17 South of Myrtle Beach in Georgetown, just over the Charleston County line, across the river from where Brittany's phone last pinged. Officials say from there, her captors took her to the northern Charleston County area. They held her against her will for a few days. Surrounded by local, state, and national law enforcement, David Thomas steps forward. He's the FBI's special agent in charge for this area. Thomas says this is no longer a missing persons case. This is a murder investigation. We believe she traveled to this area around McClellanville and uh, the North Charleston, South Georgetown area, and we believe she was killed after that. And we do know that, that, that Brittany was in this community for several days. We think she was held here against her will, at least for a, a portion of the time that she was here. Brittany's family is understandably devastated. We need your help so we can find Brittany's remains and bring her home to lay her to rest and make sure that monsters like this can no longer victimize this community or kill anyone else's child. A $25,000 reward is issued for any information, but the worst of it, the horrible details of her so-called death have yet to be revealed. That happens in federal court in August 2016, two months later. A jailhouse inmate tells law enforcement he knows who was involved in killing Brittany Drexel, he names Timothy Deshaun Taylor, a young man from McClellanville. And despite some red flags with the informant's story, the Justice Department goes all in. They bring Taylor in on a new federal charge for an old crime, a 2011 robbery at a McDonald's. Taylor drove the getaway car. He was caught, convicted, and already served his time for the state years earlier. Nevertheless, here he is, back in court. Here's what the DOJ told the judge during Taylor's 2016 hearing. The FBI says an informant saw Taylor and others sexually abusing Drexel at a popular home in McClellanville. He says he saw Drexel try to run away. She was caught, pistol whipped, and then he heard gunshots. The informant assumed Taylor's father killed her. The FBI believes the publicity around Drexel was too much. They say another informant heard the men dumped her body in a gator pit. A gator pet. But wait, have you seen a picture of Timothy Deshaun Taylor? The young man has one arm. He lost the other one when he was just a young kid. The Taylor connection was certainly a scandalous tale for the media to write about. Here's fellow reporter Ginny Ryan again. That was a huge risk 
those investigators took, the repercussions from that moment and that announcement is, have yet to be seen, really. My producer, Drew Tripp, covered the Taylor investigation extensively. With respect to the Drexel case, we dragged his name through the mud, followed the FBI down into that mud pit or alligator pit, as it were. And Taylor's family, now under a cloud of suspicion and outcasts in the community, where Deshaun's own mother, Joanne Taylor, was a pastor. And if you search for Timothy Deshaun Taylor to this day, a picture of Brittany Drexel pops up. I ran into Joanne Taylor at the federal courthouse last summer. That was five years after her son was outed by the FBI in court documents. So please stop associating him with Brittany Drexel. That was in July 2021. Around the same time, law enforcement pays another visit to Raymond Moody. The irony here? According to police reports, investigators were looking for another murder suspect who just happened to be living on Moody's property at the time. It's so hard to sit here in retrospect. And that's Ernie Merchant. He was a former romantic partner of Ray Moody. To think that I ever loved him, you know, that, but, and now I uh, feel like I never knew him at all. Ernie knew Moody well. He knew that he was capable of hurting others. Moody had a dark past that involved kidnapping and raping children. I would like to say that I saw an evil monster long before I did, because, but I didn't. The why may never be known or understood, but this task force can confidently and without hesitation answer the rest of those questions along with the who is responsible. The Georgetown County Sheriff is still trying to unravel Brittany's case because the threads that weave this story together they're thick with secrets and lies, tangled like the Spanish moss that droops from our old trees here in the Low Country. The phone rang a couple times, but she didn't answer it. But she said it was her boyfriend or something, and she would call him when she got back. We only found one camera that was facing the road. The one we did find actually showed Brittany and of course, she was walking with her head down, looking at her phone, texting. An active investigation for 13 years that's haunted her family. I felt like she was out there somewhere and she got brainwashed or something to where she wouldn't remember us and we would eventually find her. Brittany was not lost. I just started seeing these red flags. Brittany was taken just like the others. He grabbed me from behind with his hand over my mouth and around my waist and put me in the passenger seat of the car. Nobody should get a second chance to hurt a child. Coming up on Finding Brittany Drexel, I head up to Chai Lai, New York to meet Brittany's father, Chad. She was going down the wrong path and I tried my best. He shares stories about his daughter that we have never heard before. So I'll give you a story that I don't think has really ever come out. And find out why Brittany's parents thought their daughter was just a few miles down the road. And she said, oh, we're just at the beach because that's what they called Lake Ontario. And I said, I will call you when I get home, um, you know, just to check in. And that call never came. Unsolved South Carolina, Finding Brittany Drexel is a production of WCIV-TV ABC News 4. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help us reach more people by giving us a positive rating and leaving a review. For more on the Drexel case, visit abcnews4.com slash Drexel. For show updates and exclusive extras, follow Unsolved South Carolina on social media at Unsolved SC Pod.